Hello, and welcome to Ordinary People Walking an Extraordinary Path, a podcast series delving into the lives of individuals who have defied societal expectation and embark on an extraordinary path despite their seemingly ordinary backgrounds. I am your host, Sylvie Barbier, and today we have the privilege to be with our guest, Natty Lombardo. Welcome, Natty. So I'd love to, to introduce you to um, our audience. So Natty is born in Argentina. She's now based in Europe, and her background is in community development and permaculture and creative activism. And she has more than a decade of experience in working in self-organizing team as a facilitator, coach, consultant, and she helps group to cultivate and collaborative culture through behavioral change and peer-to-peer -peer support. She's also a psychedelic guide, and she supports people on their self-discovery and healing journey through psychedelic. And finally, she's the co-founder of The Hum and a member of the Inspiral Network. So welcome, Natty. Um, I'd love Thanks to for start by me here, Sylvie. Yes. Um, I'd love to start by just asking you, what are you currently, what project are you currently working on that you're passionate about? Hmm. Well, multiple ones, as usual. I can't just be doing one thing, it seems to be. Uh, so at, at the ham, currently we're developing some new courses. So that's quite exciting. I've been like, um, yeah, the last few weeks, I've been just writing a bunch of content and getting into creating a new course, like a very simple, um, basic intro course on what self-organizing is. And it's going to be a free thing that we're um, offering through through the hum. So that's quite exciting. Uh, I like creating things. I'm quite creative in that way. Um, so on one hand, we have that. On the other hand, is looking for a house with my partner and with some friends to set up a retreat center, a little bit like what you folks have over there in Bergerac. Uh, and yeah, we're looking at, you know, like trying to find a house to rent or to buy or something like this in Catalonia. So we're currently in the area exploring. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, um, yeah, I've just finished doing some courses uh, through about psychedelic therapy and that that's my new kind of passion. So, yeah, all of those things in parallel. Wow, amazing. And yeah. as this podcast is called Ordinary People Choose an Extraordinary Path, I'm actually really curious about the big, like your journey that led mm. you to now working on this project. And just yeah. simply, I'd love to understand like, First, where did you grow up um, mm -hmm. and what was mm -hmm. like growing up where you grew up? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, well, as you named, I, I was born in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, just on the outskirts of the city. Um, and I lived there, like in Buenos Aires, in the region, more or less, until I was around 26 or something. And there was a time, like, you know, I studied um, at university, I studied filmmaking, so nothing to do with what I'm doing right now. I worked in the film industry for a while when I was uh, quite young, just out of university. And there was something about that way of working that was extremely hierarchical. That just really put me off, like it didn't seem right, you know. And I was, wor I was living in a city, uh, so I was living at that time in Buenos Aires in a small apartment on my own. You know, Buenos Aires is a really big city, quite... Um, populated and it seemed like that wasn't right either that way of living um you know everyone in their tiny apartment I remember looking through the window of my apartment and seeing all these other buildings with their little lights on and everyone doing their own thing like there must be something else in life that is not this right um I kind of kept on bumping into into that that feeling of this is not right there must be something else and I guess through that uh, questioning, I came across like the ideas of permaculture and intentional community living back in the days, right? We were talking about, I don't know, 20 something years ago, <laughs> something like that. Um, and that took me to find a community just outside Buenos Aires as well, where I went to study permaculture and I connected with a bunch of other people from South America that were coming to study there. And through that, it was like, okay, this is so much more interesting. The idea of, you know, living together uh, in the land, connected to nature, 
living in a different way, connected to each other, having that sense of community around. And that led me to leave Buenos Aires, leave Argentina, actually, when I was 26, yeah, um, and started traveling. Um, just the idea was I wanted to understand better, like I wanted to go through different communities and understand how is that humans can do this, right? That it seemed to me like so foreign at the time. And at the same time, it felt so right, right? It had these two, two, two sets of feelings to it. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that growing in Buenos Aires was that. It was a bit alienating, was a little bit lonely. Um, you know, Buenos Aires is also a very dangerous city. So that thing of kind of living with fear and walking everywhere, looking like what's happening around me. So that sense of like my nervous system being activated the whole time. Um, yeah, that was a little bit the, the sense of it. And then leaving that was like, yeah, starting to discover that there was uh, more in life and that there were different ways of being uh, and connecting to people as well that um, had lived in different backgrounds and had come from different places and connecting to different cultures. Um, yeah, was pretty extraordinary in that sense. And can you tell me maybe a little bit more, even in your earlier childhood, what was the valley yeah. like? So th when you were small, were you also growing up in Buenos Aires with your family? Mm. Yeah, uh, in the suburbs. So it's not. It wasn't necessarily um, in the city. As later on, you know, when I was a bit older, I moved to the city because that's where I was working, and it made more sense. So it was the suburbs, and when I was younger, it was a little bit different, right? It was that still that time where I could play in the street with my uh, friends from the from the block and um, without too much uh, danger. Um, but that kind of rapidly changed as I became a little bit older, to be honest. Um, but being in the suburbs was was quite different. I guess that maybe um, to give a little bit of a family background on this. So my parents, my, my family, like they're all um, immigrants in a way, right? Like my great grandparents and my grandparents, <clears throat> they migrated to Argentina from Italy and from Spain. Um, and we did still have that sense of every Sunday we'll meet all together, the whole family, you know, all the cousins and all the aunties and everything. So that was quite lovely. But at the same time, my parents had to work. Both of them worked since I was very little. So I kind of grew up on my own a lot of the times. I didn't really had a lot of um, close nurturance when I was little. So I think that also is what is driven me to search for more connection with others and more interactions and more that sense of living together with others, right? So I mm -hmm. had those two things at the same time, like this huge family that we'll see once a week, potentially, and then alone at home, kind of growing up on my own. Um, Got it. So you yeah. had a two very strong contrasts of like that yeah. sense of big family belonging to the uh, a tribe and then mm -hmm. suddenly so you were only child on your parents side no I have a sister she's uh, six years older um but because of that huge um gap mm -hmm. on age as well you know I'll be at home I was quite introverted she's always been an extrovert uh she was always like going out and doing things and um, hanging out with friends but I was like at home and... on my own yeah Got yeah it. yeah Got it. No, that's really, yeah. it, uh, that's also really fascinating to see how much, you know, some childhood experience influence mm -hmm. what we then, you know, what's the que what's the question we then carry yeah. in life to look for. Totally. Yeah, definitely. And I'm really aware of that. Like it's, it's something that I'm carrying with me. Uh, and it's interesting because I think like, you know, although I can see and someone can see that experience, of, oh, okay, there's a little bit of developmental trauma there or um, something not so positive, I can also see the positive side to that. That is that I was very independent since I was quite young. And I always kind of follow my own, um, my own compass, like mm. follow my own way of, oh, there's, you know, I'm interested in this thing. I can just follow it. Or this is a question that I have. I can just do that. Um, so I was quite self-directed and um, since I was little. And I think that gave me also a lot of independence and a lot of this capacity to, 
yeah, go out into the world and just do something different than what was might have been expected. Um, you know, um, it was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. I found my own path. Yes. And coming on expectation, did you feel or receive any expectation from your family when you grew up or when not you were really, no, not really. They were quite like hands off, to be honest. Um, I guess that there's always some expectation, right? That is part of also being embedded in a culture. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think I, yeah, I felt it so deeply that it limited me. Uh, in general, I felt more like I can do whatever I want. I can choose to be whoever I want. Um, I can just go out into the world and, and find my way. And you just said something very interesting. It's like, oh, there's always maybe societal expectation. Maybe your family mm -hmm. does not put as yeah. much pressure, but... Yeah. What do you feel like? Was there something about what was the culture in Argentina when you grew up? You mm -hmm. know, you talk about violence and like mm -hmm. feeling unsafe. Mm -hmm. uh, but what would you feel like the S, like maybe some key values of the society mm -hmm. in which you grew mm -hmm. and how, how is that maybe still with you or how did mm -hmm. you kind of maybe went to design? Like I heard there's a part of you wanted to go different by choosing mm -hmm. to leave and and wanting to mm -hmm. feel safe but I'd love to understand also you know now we have a bit of the picture of your family frame but mm -hmm. also like the bigger frame of the country the culture in which you grew up mm -hmm. yeah so it's really interesting so <clears throat> I was born in Argentina in 1980 and that's the year where democracy was reestablished after many many years of having a dictatorship so it was a period of transition. So I think my early childhood was this period of transition in the whole country where we still have all this fear, um, a lot of damage and a lot of trauma of what the time of dictatorship has done to the country uh, and to the society. And at the same time, all these possibilities of, you know, new way of being able to be in this country and in this world. But the economy always was, you know, very like struggling we had tons of eras of inflation that will go up and down and it was crazy so I think there's a piece of the culture that is like it's a little bit like you have to struggle to survive but at the same time we're with a lot of ingenuity so always you have to find a way to survive and you have to find a way to do things and um and I don't know, there's a lot of um, entrepreneurship in a way uh, that happens in a country like that, right? Because there's no social security, really. There's no background. Like if you, if you have to pay rent and you have to buy food, you have to find a way to do that. Um, so I think I do have that. I carry that. And that was embedded in me quite a lot. And it has, you know, a positive and a negative side uh, to it, of course, as a lot of everything does. Um but I think that's, yeah, that's one of the things that I carry, I guess. They're always and finding yeah, the way. Here it's yeah. like, you, you, it creates like that sense of like ingenuity, creativity, also just having to mm -hmm. just figure it out, you know, yeah. and therefore maybe also a sense that you can figure it out. Like mm -hmm. you don't have a choice, but you also then feel yeah. like you, there's lots of resource in you and, and yeah. many solutions that can be found. Yeah, totally. It's very creative. It's a very creative culture in that sense. <clears throat> yeah it's funny because my my mother is Taiwanese and mm -hmm. um I wouldn't say Taiwanese society is very creative but there is definitely that sense of like you can figure it out you know yeah. because when you, there is it was a bit uh you can take initiative you can try things on because it's a bit maybe similarly to I, I was born or so um I think the martial law stopped a bit, right? I was born in 88. I think it mm. was finished a, a couple of years after. So this, um, similar, like th there's that sense of like, also something new and it's a bit chaotic when it's new because you're figuring, you have to figure it out. It's not like mm -hmm. you inherited all the structure is already there. You got to create the structure. You got to yeah. have a sense of how uh, you want it to work. Yeah, totally. And so I'd love to hear a little bit. So why here is that one turning point for you was the experiencing the hierarchy in the film industry and having mm -hmm. a strong sense of like, that's not right. Um, mm -hmm. And is there any other incident 
uh, that you feel like, oh, that had a real turning point or a book or something else that really mm -hmm. might have put you towards a certain a certain direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think like another big one was going into this community that I was telling you is um, it's called Gaia. It's the center of permaculture of Argentina. At least it was at that time. I'm not sure where are they at right now, but um, and the first time being there and sitting in a circle and you know participating in decision making with other people about what was happening in the space and um yeah going out and planting the food that we were going to eat and all those things like that was also an experience that really shaped later on how I approach being in groups and and working and the kind of work that I'm doing right now um so I think those those two had a parallel um, of, you know, showing me again, like another contrast and be like, okay, this is one way and this is another way. And this one differently, mm -hmm. definitely feels, feels more humane in a way. Um, so well, the, yeah. The and then experience of feeling like mm -hmm. that you had a say, or like your voice matter yeah. in a way, your opinion yeah. mattered. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was pretty, right. yeah. It's very profound. I still remember it, right? Like I have images in my, in my mind when I remember those moments and it's like oh yeah I was sitting in the circle and there was all these people around me and we were talking about what we were gonna do and we were making that in a like collaborative way yeah and how long did you live there for not or long I came and go um I was there for like just a few months uh, to start with and then I came and go multiple times so I kept on coming back and hanging out because then I had friends that were living there um and then every time I went so I went traveling for to start I was away I think for a year and when I came back I came and visit again and stayed there for a little bit longer and then I went traveling again and then pretty much never came back but <laughs> yeah and did you encounter any also maybe difficulties um around um, around community or around the setup of like mm. you know wanting to start to kind of maybe live a life mm -hmm. more in community, live a life mm -hmm. more connected to the land. Mm -hmm. Like, how was that transition? Like, so I hear mm -hmm. you were traveling a lot, but I'm yeah. also interested in like, were there difficulties and how did you take on, you know, those challenges? Yeah, I guess that on the short period of time that I was there, although I could start seeing there were some issues, mainly around the leadership of the space. Yeah. Um I didn't feel too much the tensions because I wasn't there for long term, right? Um, but then the more I travel around and the more I see in communities and spend time in different communities around the world, I like certain patterns started to emerge as, oh, this is one of the common challenges of what it is to live together and what it is to do this kind of work and what it is to make decisions together as well. Can you be a bit more specific? What is one yeah. that you pattern that you sure. really notice yeah sure so one is is about leadership so there's always power dynamics right in groups of humans there's always sense of leadership that emerges <clears throat> and different people carry different kind of leadership um so it tends to happen at least what i've experienced is that the founders or the people that started a project always carry a lot more weight on the decision making and always carry um, a different way of showing up in the group and in the room and uh, being perceived by the others. So it's, I think like if those characters that are in that position, if they're not that self-aware or if they don't have um, a deep intention to decentralize some of that power or to involve the others or to be more collaborative, then it can be very unbalanced and people end up leaving the project because it's like, oh, I thought we were doing something collaborative. I've been here for a while, but at the end of the day, this person, you know, calls all the shots. Um, I'm not really included. I don't have a say on where I live, so I'm going to leave. So mm -hmm. that's one of the patterns that I've noticed a lot. <clears throat> and the other one is similar in a way, and it's about um, new people coming into a project that is already being established for quite a while. And I've noticed this, especially with longer, um, long-standing communities where there's people there, married, they're a little bit older, 
Um, they've been there for a very long time. New people show up, you know, maybe younger couples or young people and show up with a lot of energy to do things with projects, with ideas. Oh, we could, you know, we could change how this is made or we can change how we're gardening, whatever it is. And those ideas tend to be shut down because maybe the older people are like, oh yeah, we tried that, didn't work. So we're not going to try it again. We're going to stay with what we learned that it works and just not change. Um, and I've noticed that pattern a lot. And then those younger folks that came in after a while, they end up leaving again because it's like, well, there's no space for me to experiment or to explore or to contribute. So I'll go somewhere else. And then you end up with these communities, with like long-standing communities that have a lot of older people, uh, maybe a few younger couples that stay, but then there's like a bit of a gap of that younger energy that can, you know, do things. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the patterns I encountered. Yeah. And um, have you, yeah, I'm also interested in like kind of what remedies or how, because what I hear is kind of one key thing there where I have a sense mm -hmm. is kind of communication. One mm -hmm. in like, the, the first one like the older and the younger generation mm -hmm. is in both ways both being heard or both feeling like what they have to bring and their value and and the the intergenerational mm -hmm. uh how the intergenerational can like mix together mm -hmm. uh, and be valued uh in both ways be valued versus you know the youth being shut down and then creating their own thing and not benefiting from the the knowledge and uh, of the older generation mm -hmm. and older generation well can't pass on their knowledge if there's if also there's not also uh, enough space for them to try their experiment that might look similar but it's also a different slightly maybe different context for people yeah. Yeah. um and what you say about the the founders being myself the founder of life itself is definitely something yeah. I notice, uh, mm -hmm. and it it does is very hard. Like um, it does require so much self awareness, as as you said, yeah. and also being aware that maybe you're not that self aware, or how much you need, like how much emotional uh, conscious availability you need to mm -hmm. to put, um, and it's but also how much is already that we grew up, we live in a cultural context. And there's so many things that are unconscious about our relationship to power and people's yeah. relationship to power that then, you know, the shadows that we have around our relationship to authority just comes right at you and bite you in the ass. And I think the, the work of community yeah. is that it forces you, like these things kind of emerge, your relation to intergenerational, your relationship to authority and hierarchy, they emerge and then you have to like do that process uh, together. Um uh and i'd love to hear a little bit maybe because um, your uh your organization the hum is kind of has a community dimension but it's not yet located in a space you know how um i'd love to have your sense of like you know uh, more and more because of online we have more and more online communities um how does that show up at the hum, you know, or how do you like create the connection, but also maybe when you're online. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I'm trying to find out what is my question, but um, <laughs> both I'm interested in how you deal with that in like, mm -hmm. you know, being a founder yourself of the hum, yeah. Richard. Yeah. And second, is there different challenges in being an online community versus a physical community? Mm. Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> so myself, how do I deal with it? Um, just by trying to stay self-aware of it, basically, right? Like I've seen these happen so much that even maybe I'll say <clears throat> I can have a, a double side to it, where it's like, I've seen this so much that I don't want to repeat it. And therefore I'm even averse to even showing up my own leadership. Because I don't want to, you know, like dampen anyone else's sense of, oh, you can try things, you know, you can do things and stuff. Um, while also balancing that with holding a vision and holding this thing of the historical knowledge of what has happened, you know, like a little bit what you were saying, like, 
where is the space where we can meet, where I can say, hey, we tried this before, for example, uh, to new people that show up and like, oh, how about we try this thing? It's like, we tried it before. This was the experience. How do you think you can try something new, being aware of, you know, what has happened in the past? Like, so making space for others to contribute anyway and to make their own discoveries and to maybe try it again. And if it fails, well, we keep on learning about it. Um, but it is about being aware of how I'm showing up and just getting feedback from others as well. Just being able to repeatedly ask for feedback. It's like, hey, how am I showing up here? I'm aware of the power that I hold. Uh, what will be more helpful for you? So you can also step into your own power. So having right. that space of like relationality to the communication and relationality to the way and how uh, we interact. I love some of what you're just sharing because one thing I notice for myself is that I think the power of an organization or of an individual in terms of their leadership, how much leadership you can exert, has also to do with the the listening of the people. Like if people like uh, mm -hmm. you only have so much power that people are willing to give you, also in a way, L like uh, yeah, totally, and and that has to do with trust and them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I trust is not specifically, I feel in our era where there are so many geopolitical crises and leadership crises and a sense of distrust in our social political system. I found that trust is very fragile currently. Mm -hmm. And, um, I know that how much leadership I can, how much people will be willing to hear from my past experience as a, a founder and like having tried lots of things has just so much to do how much they trust me right mm -hmm. yeah. and um you can't coach you can't give if people are not willing to mm -hmm. to to do that and it's a I, I it's a fascinating um relationship because for example one thing at the uh, in the hub in berlin what people had I also, we got like, oh, people had to go through their own experience. You know, you you can tell them like, this is, this is what we learned. It was like, this is the blueprint we've tried mm -hmm. and they still have to go through. And it's, um, there's something both slightly, um, I, I think it's like learning the piano. You you have to, sometimes you have to do it. They have, people have to do it themselves and make yeah. some of the mistakes themselves to really integrate the lesson. Although yeah. you can theoretically explain to them um mm -hmm. and um I think in myself the leadership I'm more I think like I've inherited a lot of this kind of more hierarchical pattern of like leadership and mm -hmm. it's true that you know we've exploded a little bit that sense of like how leadership gets exerted mm -hmm. um and I, I myself feel very confused of like how how to how to show up because mm -hmm. I, I know I can, I, I then feel like, Oh my God, I'm going to take too much space and step on people's toe, but at the same time want to be expressed. And then I disengage, like it's, it's a, not an easy balance currently in the social mm -hmm. cultural context we are in um, to be able to be self-express in our leadership without um when there's such a, a con cultural context currently about oppression and uh, dominance and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I found it very uh, fa like interesting that you're bringing that um, yeah. into the yeah. conversation. Like, oh, what is that we can put in place or how can yeah. we be aware of that? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's totally true. Like the context as well that we're living in <clears throat> there are, there is a lot that we have been unlearning as a society already <clears throat> about how things function and to try to find new ways of doing things. But we're still in this like liminal space in a way, right? There's not really a lot of um, excellent models or excellent examples out there. It's not so spread out, these ideas of new ways of living or new ways of doing things or new ways of living together, whatever that is. Um, so I think it's an exploratory space <clears throat> and we're all learning at the same time, right? 
we're yes. learning as a, as a society, as humanity. On what it's it a is. little bit what you said about Argentina and like Taiwan. It's like, oh, this is yeah. new and we have no idea how to make it. And it's going to yeah. be a bit chaotic. And yeah. also what is fascinating is that maybe different groups will have different desire of creating something new, trying something new, but there'll be different flavors, you know, different, yeah. you know, slightly um, intake of how that that's integrated. Um, totally. Yeah. And I think that's more interesting to me as well, right? There's <clears throat> currently, you know, if I'm thinking of the the clients and the people that we've been working with, there's so many different ways in which people are showing up to these new ways of working or new ways of organizing <clears throat> that it's really interesting because there's a lot more experiments going that we can learn from as a whole, mm -hmm. a lot more things being tested. Um, and I'm, you know, we're not going to land. And I think like the paradigm of there is one way of doing things and that's the right way. That's something that we're leaving behind. And probably we're going to land into a space where it's like, there's all these different models that you can try. And at the end of the day, you have to adjust it to yourself and to your context and to the people that you're with and, and to who you are as a human and, you know, where do you live? And, you know, there's so many different things where, I think like we're observing things are being more complex um, mm. than what we used to maybe. Um, mm -mm. And, and that opens a lot of possibilities as well. Yes, absolutely. It's like a lot of possibilities. And, and what you say is like, we're, is, well, it's like uh, there's a more complexification that can be very overwhelming um, yeah. to then deal with. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Like, you know, when it was just one, simple to deal with one. But when you have many, how do you create uh, order in a sense of like belonging when there's mm -hmm. just so many plenty? I, yeah. I found that in my in my personal sources that mm -hmm. in the plenty, trying to find what is also universal in the within the plenty, within the multiple. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I'd love to also understand... Um, can I can I pause yeah. pause us here for a minute? Because I think like there is something here that could be interesting to explore as well that ties a little bit what you were asking before about the online space and creating that sense of belonging. And <clears throat> we talked a little bit about the space of trust, right? You brought this idea of oh, people have to trust you and for sure. <clears throat> and I think there's something there where it's like going back to the basics and creating that space of trust is like the first level that we have to create in a team. Like if we don't trust each other as individuals, um, it's so much more difficult to deal with all that complexity. But if we trust each other as a basic, as I trust that you're doing your best and you're showing up in, in, you know, in who you are and we're connected and I trust our connection and I trust that I belong here and that we belong here, then we can deal with all the other complexities and then we can deal with the, all the challenges. Yes. But that trust needs to be built and maintained and repair. So there's already a lot of energy that needs to be put into that space. And doing it in person is way easier, right? Uh, yeah. Because we can hang out, we can see each other as like body language way more. We can do a lot of the uh, small things like, oh, let's just make a meal together and let's just sit and have a cup of tea while we look at the trees. You know, all of those things that you miss a little bit when you're in the online space. But if we're yeah, going to be doing this, connection. yeah, if we're going to be doing this online way more as it, it's already happening, and if we're building all these communities of belonging that are potentially all across the world, people all decentralized, then we do need to put a lot more effort into having those containers where we can build that trust and we can get to know each other deeply. Um, and yeah, just making space for that and not just, okay, let's just move into the action piece, but can we see it with there's it one being thing about, a bit more? Yes, because there's one thing about online. It's harder to create that sense of connection because you're not physical. But it's also you don't ha you don't deal maybe as much with like all the difficulties that also appear when you're in person. And you can yeah. also more easily check out, you know, I just yeah. turn off my Zoom or I do something else and you don't know it. Like it's a lot easier to not engage with like the awkwardness or the difficulty yeah. Uh, so, but that therefore it's it makes it harder to go dive where the juice lies, where the yeah. trust gets built, because the trust gets built when you hit maybe certain difficulty and you can like create mm -hmm. more 
understanding across uh, the different yeah. parties. Yeah, yeah, definitely. On the repair of that trust is where it kind of keeps on building, right? Yeah. Yes. You get to yes. encounter those spaces. And I think like that's the space as well where, you know, like I was saying about getting feedback. Um, it's in the space of trust that you can get that feedback. And it's in the space of trust where I can be honest with you and tell you what I'm thinking about or what's actually happening for me. Um, mm. And that's the space that actually helps us keep learning and keep growing as individuals and, you know, in the leadership and unlearning all the old patterns. It's like, oh, should I show up again in that way that I didn't? But if you can tell me about it, then I can be more mindful next time. Right. So yeah. there's a lot of this. Yeah. Nitty gritty. I'm going a little bit on the branches so you can no, bring me back. No, this is fascinating. I love it. <laughs> Having a lot of mate, this, you know, my brain is <laughs> sparkling. I'd love you to tell us a little bit also about your journey um, it, with it with psychedelic and healing, because I know sure. that this is something that uh, is now take like uh, that you've been discovering more in the last few years. Yeah. And how yeah. that plays with, you know, how is that connected with all the work you've been doing with community um, and at the hum? Yeah. Um, good question. How do they connect? Uh, we'll we'll find it. <laughs> eventually um because uh, so i think I mean, like sometimes yeah. there's always like maybe it's not so obvious a direct link yeah. but there's connection in there, your heart there are pieces yeah there are pieces for sure um but le let's start with the journey and then maybe we'll get there um so i've been personally using psychedelics myself for like therapy basically in a way uh and growth uh, a piece of that is that I had a brain injury around 10 years ago and that really impaired my cognitive capacities and my energy levels. And on my journey, trying to heal and trying to find ways that, um, you know, trying to find modalities that can help me, I found this idea of, well, psychedelics are neurogenetic. So that means they create new connections in your brain. They'll help your dendrites expand um, and so on. So I started um, trying that as a therapy and it really helped me and not only helped me to uh, improve cognitively, but it also helped me to improve as a person and to start healing uh, past traumas and to start, you know, even healing my relationship with my partner. Uh, we had, we do a lot of, um, yeah, therapeutic um, MDMA sessions together, for example. Um, and through that journey of healing myself, and understanding the power of these substances. And it's also like there's a lot of uh, renaissance on psychedelics used for therapeutic purposes. You know, MDMA is becoming legal this year. It's legal already in Australia, for example. Psilocybin, uh, it's been legalized. Psilocybin is magic mushrooms. For those that don't know, it's been legalized in many um, different states in the, in the US, but also in Europe. So... Through these spaces, like, okay, there's something really powerful here that is calling me. And I've already been supporting so many individuals with, you know, the work that we do. Um, in a way, I do a lot of coaching. And as we're experiencing here, a lot of the work of being able to collaborate and be together, it's about growth, right? It's like, I need my own personal journey. I need to unlearn new things, uh, old things. I need to learn new things. I need to develop my self-awareness. I need to grow as a person if I want to show up in a better way for others. So doing that already uh, with coaching through the hum and then being like, well, psychedelics can definitely help through that. Uh, it's a po very powerful tool that can accelerate that learning and that self-discovery. So like uh, two years ago, I started to do more training on this. So I've been doing lots of different courses and trainings to become a therapist and be able to work with psychedelics. Um, and yeah, I've been holding space for people, supporting them through their preparation and their integration. And as they become more um, mainstream and it becomes more an available therapy um, modality, basically, I think more people will also start using it in the workplace. I was actually talking mm -hmm. to a friend yesterday who was telling me that uh, in the U.S. there's now these team retreats where you take ketamine together, uh, small doses of ketamine, and you use that for, you know, being able to explore tensions, for example, that having in the 
in the relational space and not being able to to be talked about so mm -hmm. it's like you know we'll start using them as other tools uh, that we can bring to facilitate um yeah our being together and our being better humans and being able to collaborate and work in new ways mm -hmm. really thank you for um sharing and also exp you know um bringing the link yeah to that um yeah, I and haven't I'm, used it in Teams yet, by the way. But, got uh, it. I, I already got a few people being like, oh, this is really interesting. What will happen if we bring our leadership team together to do this? You know, we'll see. We'll see what will happen. Yeah. And like, I'd love to um, ask you, like, where do you see the future heading? And mm. what do you, would you like to, you know, share or say to the future generations? Mm. Where's the future heading? I have no clue. <laughs> Everything is quite uncertain, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe it is about becoming more um, more able to handle the uncertainty. Uh, as you know, our climate is changing already. It's not a thing that is going to happen in the future. It's happening already. Uh, the political landscape is very different and changing all the time. The economy of many places it's very unstable so i think it is about yeah i think my hope for the future and for the future generations is that we can do this more gracefully that mm. we can do this from a place of uh, more care and compassion and understanding that we're not separated individuals that we mm. can start seeing the interconnections between us and nature and everything else around us um, and being able to navigate the uncertainties and to create future systems and future possibilities uh, that feel more nourishing for everyone. Yeah. And um, maybe lastly, or I don't know, because I always can keep going on, but I'd love <laughs> to know um, what's the biggest thing you had to let go recently? Hmm. Mm. What is the biggest thing? Hmm. I think I'm still letting go of many things. Um, I'm in the process of, at least. Um, I think one of those is letting go of, you know, I named a little bit this thing of I had a brain injury and I had to do this healing journey. Through that process, I became an individual, right? I, ha I was someone, then I had a brain injury and suddenly I was someone else. And now I'm in the process of letting go of that someone else that was the person that was injured and that was the person that had um, trauma and mm. that was caring. And I'm in the process of understanding, okay, if I'm not this individual, if I'm not holding this personality anymore, who am I now? So I'm letting mm. go of this other version of me <laughs> on, you know, on top of the multiple ones that I've already been. And starting to embrace a new one. And I'm still discovering who is this new one. So we'll see. So it just so I maybe recreate to really hear, like, or let yeah. it sink in for myself. So yeah. you, after your brain injury, there was an identification of yourself as the injured person. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Thanks for reframing that way. Uh, and you've been letting go identifying yourself as this injured person as mm -hmm. you're healing and then therefore that's opening up for you well if I'm no longer identifying myself as this injured person then who can I be and yeah. you're just sitting in that question who can I be if I'm no longer injured yeah yeah that's a beautiful reframe thanks um and what are you starting to discover um what am I starting to discover I think I'm welcoming more um, the space of, oh, I can actually have energy and I can actually uh, do new things that I couldn't do before. Um, mm. And yeah, just welcoming this other facet of me that had been dormant for a long time that is more energetic and more joyful and more creative and has capacity uh, to mm. do things, you know, for a long time. I kind of had, I, I was struggling a little bit with like a chronic fatigue kind of thing that, you know, it can come back at any time because it's always there, but at the moment it's not. So it's like, okay, 
if you know I don't have to be so careful about how I spend my energy I actually have more I can do more things instead of being like oh no I shouldn't you know I shouldn't put myself out there too much I shouldn't be exhausting myself too much because mm -hmm. this thing is going to happen right so kind of letting go of that that fear yes. and just yeah and I because sometimes it's also it's not just how we identify ourselves, but it's also how mm -hmm. other identify us that mm -hmm. makes it very hard for us oh, to, yeah. to break free from a pattern mm -hmm. uh, or yeah. break, you know, create a new. Yeah, yeah. anything for you about uh, around that, you know, maybe mm -hmm. because sometimes when we we try, we're taking on a lot of growth in the growth and transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the people around us are very used to and identify mm -hmm. us with a maybe previous way of being or previous way of yeah. identifying. I'd love to hear like if you had that experience mm -hmm. happen in your life and how did you ha manage it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like that's really interesting because it, it just kind of reminded me of why I also love traveling, right? I traveled around the world for like around five, six years um, and I kind of like, my backpack and being you know on my own traveling to a new place every time meeting new people and one thing that I loved about that was this like oh no one knows me so I can be whomever I want right now right mm -hmm. I can show up as who I am right now and they're they have no context of me yes. so they're meeting me as who I am right now yeah um, I think that's one of the beautiful things um and I haven't encountered so far too much of like resistance from others or uh, being like, who's this new person that is showing up? Um, mm -hmm. At least not in a negative way, right? Because I feel like maybe maybe it feels more positive um, and it feels more, you know, easier to welcome uh, these new sides of me that are showing up now. Um, but yeah, it's a thing to pay attention to, I guess. And yeah. And yeah, have more conversations. Uh, I guess that my context is changes quite a lot as well. Uh, I guess that the probably the most difficult relationship in that regard will be my partner uh, because yes, we're so that. closely together, right? And there's always pieces there where it's like, oh, you have changed or, oh, you're changing. And for both of us to be able to notice mm -hmm. and, and have those conversations and be like, it seems like you're reacting to something from the past and not to who's right here in front of you um, yes. so it's just being more mindful because yeah. that's the thing with like close partner the way yeah. you and Richard are, are partner but life partner but also work partner I have that yeah. with Rufus yeah but I guess with work partner or family you know they just yeah. you can easily have it like oh my mom is this way or they have like Sylvie's this way and with yeah. your partner you just like I know like them like the back of my mind they're this yeah. way and it can be very constraining mm -hmm. to to this growth because it's very hard to then experiment or show up because when you're then so close with someone you kind of almost interbe with them like mm -hmm. your energy flows so much but your view of them and their view of you flow into you and flow into them so much and yeah. I'm quite interested in what you're discussing like the the need for healing or repairing the trust or mm -hmm. coming anew and and sometimes maybe what you say, like the traveling, meeting new people allows to kind of bring a fresh energy into mm -hmm. the mix that allows maybe the fresh breath to come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I I really love, you know, with, with my partner, for example, I like seeing him in new contexts. And especially if I'm not, you know, right next to it, where I can observe it a little bit from the distance and be like, oh, this is an interesting character. You know, there's something new showing up with new mm. people or in yeah. a different in the different context that I wouldn't normally see myself um so that's interesting as well being able to have that distance and and recheck once in a while like who is this character in front of me and same with myself right like who is this character in the mirror like can I allow myself also to change can I allow myself to show up in a different way with myself mm -hmm. instead of Absolutely. feeling like I know who I am or Yes, our self-identification with like, I am this way and I'm not that mm -hmm. way is the greatest yeah. prison. And yeah. funny enough, I feel like I had maybe recently a bit of a reverse journey from you, which is I identify myself as this bubbly, joyful and messy and up and down person. Mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. And we also with maybe sometime diagnosis, having a diagnosis mm. about, you know, mm. certain mental condition. Yeah. I have a diagnosis of it being cyclothemic. And mm -hmm. I see that sometimes it's not, it's a blessing, but it's also very constraining because mm -hmm. suddenly I put myself in a box and I present yeah. myself potentially in a box yeah. and everything gets defined by that. And I identify, now it helps maybe explain certain like characteristic, but it like, uh, there is something kind of both liberating and constraining about diagnosis or, and then identifying with a diagnosis in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as I said, like I identify a certain way and, you know, recently with pregnancy, I had no energy. And then I, I it was, it was really hard because I was like, who, I don't recognize myself or it's like this other part that is coming up. And, and, and I saw that actually what was the most damaging, it was to identify with my body so much, like to, with mm. my illness, with mm. the physical symptom, like. Mm. If I'm sick, then I'm this type of person. I'm a sick person versus I have these body sensation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it's a very difficult thing to uh, hold the awareness because the mind and the body is also so interlinked. You know, that's why there's a the quote of like a well body and a well mind, a well mind and a well body. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, but the identification is, is, uh, yeah. I think it's the biggest thing is the biggest thing that uh, stunt growth, our inner growth, mm -hmm. our inner exploration. Totally. Is this thing of putting ourselves into a box of this is who I am, right? As you were saying before, like, this is who I am. Therefore, you know, these are my choices. This is how I show up. This is how people see me. This is my personality. Mm -hmm. And if we can at least hold a little bit of an open, an open door to that box and be like, Right now, this is who I am, but I don't know who I'm going to be tomorrow, right? Mm. And 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 I can change as well. I think that's the you know yes. the growth mindset that allows us to move forward and be like, this is who I am, but do I want to be this way or do I want to be differently? And, it's and the I can same choose. With our, and it's the same with our society, with our world. You know, we yeah. sometimes identify our society, our world, so much like this is just how the world is. You know, politics yeah. is corrupt, or you know, capitalism is like, and it will never change. And this is just yeah. who we are, and what we can do, we can't do. And it closes us into a box, and it allows very little growth or exploration and transformation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah. so the way we identify as individual, we do that also collectively with our culture and our way of functioning. And as you yeah. mentioned, you know, like our way of operating as community and others. Totally. Um, yeah. Anything last thing you'd like to say? Hmm. Oh, just that I really enjoy chatting with you and thank you for inviting me here and, and talking. Yeah, I enjoy our conversation so much. It's already sparking a lot of ideas and, you know, that I'll keep percolating through uh, through my day. Yeah. Same here. It was lovely yeah. to have you. And I hope um, that our audience really also got as much joy into listening as we had into uh, chatting <laughs> to each other. Yeah, let's hope so. And bye, everybody. Bye.